Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and dear colleagues. Uh, I am Dr. Marco Lucchetti, and I am the European Clinical Manager at GL Care. Uh, thank you for joining today this session. A crucial part of uh, perioperative, perioperative care is the prevention of anesthesia and surgery related complications that may compromise uh, patient outcomes. So leading to prolonged recovery times and higher costs. Uh, monitoring relevant clinical parameters before, during and after surgery and delivering a personalized anesthetic strategy may help clinicians to improve postoperative patients outcome reducing the incidence of complications. Today, I have uh, the honor and pleasure to host uh, the first of these Meet the Expert sessions uh, at Euro Anesthesia 2020 sponsored by G Healthcare. I would like to remind you that this session will be recorded. Uh, we will have uh, some time in the end for discussion. So please raise your hand when you want to ask questions, you, you can find the raise hand functionality in, in, the, in the chat window um, or otherwise, but you, you can even ask uh, by, by, by digiting in, in the chat. Uh, now with further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, expert today. Manfred Blobner is a professor of anesthesiology and chair of the research unit, Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine, Technical University of Munich in Germany. He is a leading expert in neuromuscular transmission monitoring. Uh, and Professor Blobner will speak uh, about back to basics, when to use train of four or uh, uh, PTC for depth of neuromuscular block evaluation. Uh, so, Professor Blobner, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much indeed. I'm uh, very happy to speak about uh, neuromuscular monitoring. Any talk about neuromuscular monitoring is always a pleasure for, my, for me as well. So uh, today I am speaking about uh, when TOF or when PTC has to be used or is appropriate to be used um, for uh, monitoring of depth of the neuromuscular block. Um, I will uh, structure my talk into three parts. And the first part is simply to explain what, diffic what different kinds of stimulation uh, neuromuscular monitors um, provide uh, the, uh, the practitioners. So it's the PTC, the post-tetanic count, it's the TOF count, the TOF ratio. And in terms of historical uh, sense, I also talk about double burst stimulation. Uh, most of all, I'm always asked about that at the end of my talk. So today I decided to in, uh, incorporate in uh, this talk. So what's post-tetanic count? Post-tetanic count is a stimulation mode that is defined by a um, strictly defined uh, order of stimulations. It starts with single twitches and is followed by a tetanus. It's a 50 hertz tetanus and the tetanus lasts for five seconds. Then there is a break of three seconds and after that, again, single twitches, every second one twitch is applied to the respective nerve. And there are 10 in some monitors, 20 single twitches that can be counted, simply counted. Because if there is a neuromuscular block, like you can see in that part of the slide, then the typically uh, observation is that after the single twitches, there is a response to the tetanus, and this response is decreasing. And after the break, the single twitches are potentiated. And this potentiation effect is used in cases in which to single twitches, there is no response. 
following tetanus, there may be a response and the number of twitch responses to the single twitches post the tetanus is the so-called post tetanic count. The standard stimulation mode, however, is a drain of force stimulation. And there can be drawn two informations. First, it can be drawn the information, the count of the responses to the four twitches. And if there is a count of four, then all typical objective monitors are able to calculate the relation of the fourth twitch response in relation to the first one. And this relation is called the TOF ratio. So if there is not, if there are not four responses to the four stimuli, then you can say there is one response, TOF count of one. If there are two, it's a TOF count of two. And if there are four, all normal objective monitors will displace not only the number of four counts, but also the relation of the force in order to the first. More historically is the double burst simulation. And it was invented by a group, uh, firstly uh, invented by B.B. Morganson. And the reason is that this relation of the force to the first can be not easily touched by tactile sense. The second and the third make it unable for a human tactile sense to define if there is a decrease because the stepwise decrease makes our sense feeling that they are so similar. And the consequence is that at a TOF ratio of 0.4, that means the fourth one has 30% of the uh, first one, many anesthetists are not able to touch this fading. And at a TOF ratio of 0.6, only 20% of the uh, practitioners are able to say, yes, there is a fading because the fourth one, which is only 20% of the uh, fourth, first one, 60%, uh, uh, it's is fading. Therefore, the double burst has been invented and the double burst, there are two small tetany in a difference of uh, three quarters of a, a second. And these two ones can be easier differentiated. And so at later phases of the neuromuscular recovery, there can still be touched the um, fading. But the problem is that even at an 0.8 level of TOF ratio, which is accepted to be definitely the low, the human sense is not anymore able to feel any, any fading. Therefore, it's a improvement in the 80s and 90s the last century, but nowadays it's not anymore necessary because objective monitors are able to correctly displace the TOF ratio in any part of the uh, neuromuscular recovery. And that's the order in which we typically work um, in, in, uh, in a clinical situation. If there is no response, no response to post-tetanic, but the post-tetanic count of zero and the TOF count of zero, we speak about an intense block. And if after a tetanus, there are them counts. If their counts are greater than one, we speak about a deep block. And uh, the next step on the recovery um, track is a moderate block where we have one, two, or three responses to train of force stimulation. And actually at the end, we can calculate the TOF ratio, which has to be greater than 0.9 to accept a complete recovery. So post tetanic count is used in cases of intense or deep block. Then if the post tetanic count is about eight, nine or 10, you can switch over to TOF stimulation. And then you have a TOF count most likely of one or two in that situation. This will recover further. And at the end of the, of the track, there is a TOF ratio, uh, which clearly states you 
if the patient is completely recovered or not. So the question then to use post-tetanic count is clearly related to the question, when do we need deep block? Otherwise, if the block is not necessarily deep, we of course do not need a post-tetanic count stimulation technique. So we have it done in the- in 2008. First, when, when we decided also to oh, do sorry. such a study That's about one of the problems why I tried at to, the moment to, to the come uh, to stop the over the ethical committee had requested to give patients with this is a part of the my first presentation. Oh, sorry. Um, we have done a study in uh, 2008 in which we um, had. Um, investigated if deep block improves surgical conditions. A so-called proof of concept study because in that study, it was our aim to show if there is any uh, improvement by, um, by uh, a, a deep block compared to no block. And what you found in that study is that there is a the difference committee in terms of laparoscopic cholecystectomy to give patients with poor surgical conditions to, um, a rescue dose of opportunity. Uh, pregnant movements, to abdominal muscle movements, and inadequate usability. What we have learned from some uh, further um, investigations is that uh, deep block is not necessarily, uh, is not necessarily uh, applied uh, during every situation of uh, uh, surgery. Yeah, wonderful. Deep versus moderate block. That study has been performed by Martini and colleagues, and they exactly investigated if there is a need for deep block over the complete uh, period of the surgical procedure. And what they did is they did 24 laparoscopic cold cystectomies, and they asked the surgeons, to quote, to rate the surgical conditions. Every 15 minutes, they quoted if there is excellent or not acceptable surgeons. The mean scores have been uh, uh, evaluated. And as you can see, there is a difference between uh, the two groups, moderate and deep, which is not so big. More important is that if you're going to the individual ratings, during uh, uh, the uh, during uh, the surgical procedure, and Martini and colleagues could show, and you can see here that in the group uh, with deep block, at any time point of surgical surgical procedure, there were um, surgical ratings of four or five. Only one time there was a surgical rate of three. That there they the deep block was able to provide good or excellent surgical conditions throughout the procedure. And you can see with a moderate block, there were some more points during surgery in which the surgical conditions were not acceptable. That's a rate of one. And importantly, these periods in, uh, during surgery were only one, one measuring point. So with other words, during the surgical procedure, the surgeons needed excellent, uh, needed deep block, not throughout, but during the moment when they inserted uh, the, the machines, in the moment when they inflated the abdomen, but not during the rest of the surgery. Okay, and this study uh, exactly uh, follows this uh, track. Uh, Fuchsbull and colleagues, uh, uh, did a study in uh, morbidly obese patients uh, during gastric bypass surgery. And this uh, study was uh, done as follows. During the complete uh, surgical procedure, there was a moderate block. That means a tough count between one and three. But at the moment of the gastrojejunal anastomosis, the surgeons were asked if the surgical conditions are excellent, good, acceptable, or poor. And what happened was is, um, what happened is uh, 20 patients had with this, um, um, with this uh, in this situation, excellent conditions at moderate block. The residual 65 were randomly allocated to either 
continuum of moderate block or to go to um, deep block. And this deep block was introduced by additional rocuronium. So after this randomization, there were two groups of patients. The one had potency count of, count of one to three, and the other had a tough count of one to three. And then they asked the surgeons again about the surgical conditions. And then they found that the surgical conditions uh, were improved in almost all patients who had been um, deepened uh, the block by P, by, uh, to PTC one or two or three. Importantly, again, is it really necessary to have excellent conditions? I assume that good conditions would be okay, but if there is a need to do so, why not? And you have, and you have the uh, neuromuscular monitoring device that allows you to control it. Importantly, importantly, uh, this improvement of surgical conditions does not make a difference between uh, in terms of interoperative complications. So let's come to the last point. Uh, the last point, why not to use facial nerve or any other sites? And it's clearly related to that what I have told you uh, during the last uh, um, description of post-titanic count. Um, the neuromuscular monitoring uh, sites do are not the same. Uh, if you have um, the uh, different levels of block, you can see different uh, reactions of uh, several muscle uh, muscles. The upper airway muscles are very sensitive to neuromuscular blocking agents, while the arm, the hand, the neck, the trunk is less sensitive to neuromuscular blocking agents. The most, um, the, the most uh, um, resistant muscle in the body is the diaphragm. The diaphragm needs the highest doses of neuromuscular blocks. That means the surgeons during laparoscopic surgery who see the diaphragm moving are partly right when they say, yes, we, have, we need a deeper block because we measure at the extremity and at that level, there might be a complete block or so the diaphragm is still moving. On the other hand, at the end of surgery, the most sensitive part of the muscles, the swallowing function is still paralyzed in cases in which, in cases in which the patient can easily breathe because the diaphragm is not anymore paralyzed. And now it becomes clear why we need, why we need uh, information, not only uh, definitely from the arm and why we need the post-titanic count. Because when we wanna um, paralyze the diaphragm, we have to go down to levels of block that are deeper than those that can be measured by TOF count. Then you need block levels of PTC one or two. And if you don't, and if you can't measure it, it's not possible to control such a deep block. So my last slide exactly comes back to that question. PTC of zero is a complete block and that means the diaphragm is not anymore able to move. Complete block of the steam, the leg and the arms is given at a post-titanic count between one and two. A tough count between one and two, the moderate block, and there is almost in most cases an acceptable surgical paralysis. Later steps are clearly related to the swallowing function uh, because this is very critical in order to avoid uh, residual blocks and its complications. So thank you very much for your attention. And please apologize that uh, my slides had some uh, um, 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 tracks that are not planned for this presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Blobner, uh, for your interesting uh, perspective on uh, how to use uh, TOF and PTC. So uh, I don't see any 
hand raised here. So maybe I will start with, with one question from my side. Um, is there any indication to apply uh, double bar stimulation when quantitative uh, neuromuscular monitoring devices are used? No, it is not. No, it is not because uh, the, there is no additional information. Um, if you doubt the monitor and start uh, feeling it by manual touch, maybe, maybe. But uh, if you're using electromyography or the kinemiography um, of the Datex monitors, there is an option, but there is no clinical need. Okay. Thank you. Any question from the audience? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, any questions? Otherwise, maybe I will ask one more. Uh, okay. I will ask one more. Uh, so, uh, why do we need a uh, post-tetanic count? Couldn't we simply wait until the train of four count is higher than one? Yeah, exactly. Uh, important question. If you're only waiting uh, to the moment when, when uh, the neuromuscular function is recovered uh, in terms to give neostigmine or something else, it's okay to wait. But um, as mentioned in one of my um, last slides, it's important, if it's important to control the depth of block at a PTC 1-2, that means if you have to guarantee that the patient's diaphragm is not moving, if the patient has to be completely silent um, in a situation in which, for example, laparoscopic surgery is done and, and there is a critical anastomosis, or sometimes in eye surgery, if the patient is not deep and an, uh, anesthetized and you have to guarantee that the eyes do not move peeling operations for example and in, in, in a retina surgery then um, you have to go back down to ptc12 and you have to guarantee that it doesn't increase over five and so the complete monitoring is not any more in the in the period which we are used to do in the in the area of post uh, tough uh, count or um, tough ratio uh, in the area where we are going to uh, complete recovery if we have to guarantee deep block then you have to switch over to post tetanic count excellent thank you um, any question from the audience We have a uh, few more minutes to go. So maybe if there is no question from the audience, I will ask one more. Um, how frequent do you expect uh, the need for a deep block in a, in, in a usual, a common surgical population? Okay. Um... Let me turn. Uh, my, let me start my answer. Turn around. In every patient, in every patient that is paralyzed with the neuromuscular blocking agents, we need quantitative, objective neuromuscular monitoring. And the standard approach is a tough stimulation. So that's the base you are working on. But if the tough count is zero. That means there is no response. Then you have to consider that either there is something wrong with your system or the patient is very deeply blocked. And then you have to use it, the post-titanic count, in order to look what happens. And uh, that's the most frequent use of post-titanic count one or two times during one surgical procedure. Surgical procedures that actually need deep block throughout at least a specific part of that surgical procedure, that are about one to 5%, depending on the cohort 
that is typically uh, operated in a hospital. If there is much uh, laparoscopic surgery, thoracoscopic surgery, then the amount of deep block uh, requiring surgeons is increasing. If you do orthopedic surgery, for example, a tough count or moderate block with between tough count one and three should be appropriate. So one to 5% during a longer period, one to two times following intubation in order to have an idea when the um, response to tough count comes back is a good estimate. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? We have maybe one minute more. So just a very short question and a very short answer. Uh, you, you show here uh, EMG-based neuromuscular monitoring, so <laughs> electromyography-based monitoring and accuracy you can trust. Uh, just very briefly, what, what is the main advantage of electromyography in terms of accuracy? Yeah, um, whichever you do, whatever you monitor, the most important thing is precision. And in order to have a precise monitoring, you need noise control. That means everything that interferes with your monitoring, with, with which a measured size may become a problem. And um, mechanical, ba me mechanic-based measuring system, again, whatever you measure, it, uh, have to be controlled mechanically, which is simply a need for people who apply that system. Um, electromyography or all electrical things can be do it can have a noise control by the inbuilt filters and electromyography is the one and only neuromuscular monitoring system uh, that um, is based on el an electric noise control and therefore it's the highest level of accuracy that is available for quantitative neuromuscular monitors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Blobner. Uh, our time together uh, has come to, to an end. Um, so again, thank you, Professor Blobner, on behalf of G Healthcare, dear colleagues, thank you for your time and for your attention and um, stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>